Uh, yep, this is the last class for many, many hours. So we got time. I think it's only but like another hour or so of material, maybe less. OK, so what I like to call psychological warfare, it's actually basically just like you know tips and methods that you could use to um, to not only maximize the amount of if that you gain, but to try to not necessarily manipulate other people, but try to increase your, um, gosh, I knew the word for this. Try to increase the, the potential you have for actually gaining that ISK and um, stopping, well, not really stopping others, but discouraging others from um, trying to do things like sniping or maybe even um, make them snipe incorrectly. In any case, yeah, generally market PVP is what some people like to call it. But um, usually when people say market PVP, all they really mean is, is the whole um, outbidding people by one penny, you know, putting 0 0.01 higher on the buy orders and 0 0.01 um, lower on the sell orders. But there are other things besides that you can do, such as, first thing, I, well, I don't know what the official names of these things are, so I kind of made up names, but these are the, the terms I use all the time. And they're descriptive enough that hopefully people will know what they mean. The first one is called parallel order sniping. And what parallel order sniping is, is having two different orders, either two different buy orders or two different sell orders. And what, what this does is it tries to it tries to weed out snipers, basically, and then out-snipe them right away. What you, how you do it is you have two orders. One order is small volume, maybe even just one item, but chances are pretty low that somebody will just snipe a single item. And the other order is your real order. It's the one that has, like, all the stuff you want to sell. Now, for it to work, you have to understand, well, to understand why it works is um, you have to understand the how most snipers um, do it, do their sniping. And it's basically, they just take a look at the market like you would normally do. And if they see that somebody has posted um, a buy order above theirs or a sell order below theirs, then they'll just modify their order so that it's now the, the highest or the lowest, depending on if it's a buy or sell orders. The key is that you can't modify an order more than once every five minutes. There's a timer. So if you try to, if you modify an order and then you try to modify that order immediately again, it'll tell you, sorry, you can't modify this order for, you know, four minutes, 50 seconds, or however much time is left. And that's supposed to prevent sniping, although five minutes is pretty short, so it, it doesn't really stop people from sniping anyway. But what you can do is to Set those two orders. For example, let's say you're trying to sell um, 100,000 rounds of EMP, small, EMPS. So you would make one order for 10,000, well, even less than that, probably 5,000 would be plenty. So make one order for 5,000 rounds and put up that order and then wait a few seconds and just every so often refresh your, um, your market window and you might see suddenly suddenly somebody or maybe even like two or three different people try to snipe you. Okay, so you set, you, you set up your small dummy order and then you just wait a little while, maybe 30 seconds or something like that at most, to see who snipes you because a lot of times um, the real um, hardcore marketers, they're sitting there at their computer looking for somebody to snipe every five minutes just so that they can. And as soon as they snipe you, that's when you put your real order up and snipe them so that your real order is at the top and they can't re-snipe your real order for, you know, four, out, four hours, four minutes and 30 seconds. So that's one method that you could try to do some anti-sniping. Of course, if they're doing the same thing, then you're kind of going to be playing ring around the rosy around each other for a little while. But at some point, somebody's going to say, eh, I'm just going <laughs> to let them sit for a while and then put up my market orders. Okay, another thing that you can do is well, there's two different things you could do, and they're not really techniques in that. They're just two different things that have their pluses and minuses. One is um, setting up mass volume market orders. Like, at, when I say mass volume, it's mass volume 
in relation to that item. So, for example, if you're selling EMPS ammo, 100,000 is not a mass volume order. 100,000 is like fairly typical for a lot of orders. But if you are selling, for example, um, a large projectile turret, if you had 100,000 of them, that, that's a mass order. In fact, that's a ridiculously large order. <laughs> but yeah, it, the mass depends on um, the item itself. So what, what mass volume orders means is, is ma a mass volume order for that item. So if you had, well, for example, like I said, um, a large projectile turret, and you had like, say, 50 of them or 100 of them, then you could go ahead and set all 100 of them to sell for whatever is the, um, you know, the lowest sell price. Now, the pluses and minuses to the mass volume orders is that, first of all, the plus, there's the plus in that there's less work to unload that entire volume, um, and also that it only uses up one order slot. You know how you have to train scales to get um, more slots so that you could put up more orders? It uses only up one of those slots. So, and even when you have really high scales and you, you, know, you could put up, say, 45 simultaneous orders like I can right now or even more, um, sometimes you'll find that every single one of those slots really counts. So um, doing something in mass volume it can help you that way, that you'll have more slots to, um, to be able to use for other items. And like I said, it's less work to unload all of it. The, al the alternative to mass volume orders is if you had 100 projectile turrets to sell, you could sell them in like um, lots of 20 a piece, so you try to sell them in five lots of 20 or something like that instead. So it's less work to unload the volume and it, and it frees up the slots compared to the small volume orders. And it also can discourage market entry until the volume goes down. That's a, a little bit of the psychological warfare side of it, is that if somebody sees that you have a ton of stuff to sell, then there's a really good chance that they're just going to say, all right, I'm, I'm not even going to bother getting into the market right now because if I go in right now, we're just going to go into a, um, a price war because it's going to take a long time to sell all that stuff. So if you had 100 turrets to sell and say somebody else had 20 turrets to sell and you both put those things in the market, if you're both hardcore traders or if you're both you know, regular traders, you might end up spending the next week and a half just sniping each other every day, just slowly, you know, jumping, I'm sorry, just leapfrogging it over each other just to try to get the, um, you know, try to be the one with the, the lowest sell order at any given point in time. And eventually you're going to slowly, you know, diminish the margin on that item. It might take forever if it's a, like a really high priced item, but still, you, you will slowly diminish your, um, your, your margin over time. So with that in mind, some people will just say, you know, it's not even worth trying to get into a bidding war and I, I don't really want to um, want to deal with that hassle right now anyway. So I'm just going to not sell my stuff until he's done selling most or all of his stuff, which is, by the way, something that you might want to consider every so often. If you see somebody else put up a mass volume order, you might want to say, okay, even though I got 20 of this stuff to sell, um, it might be better to just wait before I start selling it. Either that or um, something I'll go over later on is to um, haul trade it and combine haul trading and station trading and just take your item to a different trade hub and sell it there instead where somebody doesn't have a mass order. Okay. Now, some of the drawbacks of the mass volume order is that, first of all, it could encourage sniping. Um, it really, sniping really has almost no effect on the mass volume orders. But it, for some reason, people seem to think it has um, a good effect on it, and they try to snipe you anyways, because the thinking is that, okay, this person has like 100 items to sell, and I only have, say, two. So if I snipe him a lot, he's going to lose a lot more money each time he modifies his order. Well, I'm, I'm only losing a little tiny bit of money each time I modify my order, because I, like, if my new um, order is only two isk difference than my previous order, then I'm only losing two isk times two items, which is just four isk. 
Whereas this other guy, if he changes his order by two ISK, he's losing two ISK by 100 items. Well, okay, that's not a very good example. But, um, yeah, if the, um, if the change in the volume were really big, you know, he might lose, say, 1,000 a, a ISK or 100,000 ISK or something like that. And they think that that really has a big effect on, um, on the profit that the, the mass volume order might get. But it, it really doesn't because it's only just a very small percentage of the total volume. So um, if you do have a mass volume order and you see people trying to snipe you a lot, don't really worry about it. It's not really cutting into you very much unless they're really you know, driving the price to some ridiculous level. But it does encourage sniping anyway. It's people think that it, that it makes a big difference, so they try to do it. And also, like I said earlier, eventually you can drive the market to smaller margins. Oh, it doesn't really happen easily because a lot of times, for example, your margin might be 100,000 ISK or maybe, you know, like in the Arbalest missile launcher case, you know, 2.5 million ISK. It's hard to get rid of, of um, a margin range that large, especially if you're only sniping by a penny at a time. You're going to have to snipe a whole lot of times to to bring 200 or 2.5 million if down a penny at a time. But every so often, somebody will try to snipe by like 100,000 instead. You know, instead of um, setting up a sell order that's just a penny lower, they'll set, they'll set up a sell order that's 100,000 disk lower just to try to discourage people um, to continue the sniping war. And if enough people do that while you've got a high volume order, in the market, then you will eventually, slowly, but eventually get rid of a lot of your um, profit margin. And it's really susceptible for high volume orders because it's going to typically take you a long time to sell that high volume order. So if that high volume order, you know, is in, is in the market because it takes a whole month to sell all 100 of those items, for example, then during that whole month, your, mar your margin, your profit margin is never going to get any better. And as people keep sniping, it's going to slowly and slowly get a little bit worse every time. And so that is probably the, the, um, the biggest drawback to setting up a mass volume order, is that you're, you'll never be able to get a better profit margin than, than what you originally started off with. And it, it'll just, it can get slowly worse. And finally, the last drawback, it's not a really huge drawback, but it's important to some people in that you can be identified as a major marketer. You can, you can identify, um, some people like to identify who their, their primary competition is. And if you set up a really big volume order like that, then what they can do is just buy one single item. And even if, if they have to take a loss to do it, it's, it's really not a huge loss if it's just a single item. And they'll do it just to see the name of the person they're buying from. And then they keep a little list of people who um, they think are like, you know, major market players for their market. And I don't know exactly what they do with that list, but um, maybe if they, you know, if you collect enough information, you know, you buy it lots of single items and you can see who is, um, who is doing what with what items, then maybe you could be able to use that to, for example, identify a person and if you know enough about their market habits, like you know that this, this is the kind of person who'll put up a lot of mass volume orders and never take them down again, so it's not worth um, trying to compete directly, then you, 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 know, you could use that information to um, to say, okay, this is not a good person to try to um, to snipe a lot, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, market collusion. So yeah, um, some people go to those lengths to to try to make as much um, as much money out of the market as they possibly can by actually trying to identify who exactly are their major competitors, and then try to identify when their major competitors are actually. Um, you know, they're in the market competing against them and then modifying their habits or their, or their, um, their plans to try to, to work around those competitors. And yeah, exactly. Um, they could also add you to, actually, that's something that I totally forgot about. But yeah, they, if they identify you, they could add you to their, um, 
their buddies list so that they know when you're online, so that they know when is a safe time to try to snipe. So yeah, thank you for reminding me about that one. Okay, so the opposite side of the mass volume orders is the small volume orders. And it also has its um, advantages and drawbacks, which are basically the exact opposite of the mass volume orders advantages and drawbacks. If you use small volume orders, like if you, even if you have a whole lot of a single item to sell, instead of selling it all at once, you only sell it piecemeal, you know, a little bit at a time. Um, first of all, it's less conspicuous. If you only sell small um, items, then nobody really thinks that you are a, um, a major player in that market and they won't try to, you know, to do the, um, to do any direct market PVP against you, to coin the term. And it also kind of discourages sniping in the same way that mass volume orders encourage sniping. It doesn't really, it doesn't really make much of a difference how much sniping goes on, whether it's small or large volume. But for some reason, people um, are more prone to not snipe small volumes. Maybe they think, you know, they're going to sell, the, sell out their stuff really quickly anyway, so it's not really worth sniping, that kind of thing. And the, um, the drawback to it is, Again, the, um, the opposite of the advantages to mass volume orders, but mostly it's just it's a lot more work over time. It uses up more of your of your slots of your order slots, and it's just more work having to you know every time you sell five items, you got to put five more back up on the market, etc. Let's see, Brennick comments that, and if there's enough margin to play with, and you need quick money, you can get high volume traders to buy your order by selling low. Yeah, that's, a, actually, I think I might go over that later on. Or maybe not. Well, just in case, I'll go ahead and mention it right now. But yeah, if you sell something in really low quantities, then people might actually, like other traders, might actually be encouraged to buy you out just to get you out of the market. So, you know, if somebody's trying to sell 10,000 of an item and you walk in with two of an item that, sells for, instead of like you know, sniping him for just a penny, if you snipe him for say 100,000 ISK or something like that, it might seem to him that it would be better to just buy your two items from you just so that he's back on the top instead of moving his entire you know, 10,000 items all the way up to your new price level. So he, he just might buy out your two items and hey, quick money for you. Okay. Well, actually, that is the thing I was going to talk about next. Um, I called coerced buyouts. So yeah, wh when you have a really low volume, <laughs> I, I guess I just talked about it, but I'll go over it in detail. If you have a really low volume and you want to um, just try to sell it quickly, not necessarily at at the best, um, largest amount of profit that you can get, but if it's low volume, you know, if it's just a couple of items, maybe you, you don't really care that much about profit because you know you might have something else at really high volume that you could make a lot more profit out of and you just want to get rid of those those two items or then you could try to coerce a buyout from somebody else, which is exactly what I just mentioned. You know, put only those two items onto the market, but set it to some price where you'll still make a profit. But if if that other person selling a mass volume order were to snipe you, he would lose a huge amount of his profit. And that would actually um, make him consider possibly buying you out, just buying out your items himself, and then you know he'll sell them later on just to get you out of the market so that his stuff can sell. Now, it doesn't always work because if you go in with two items, a lot of times people will just say, oh, it's only two items. He'll probably sell those really quickly, and then people will start buying from me again. So he might not even sell it. But then that doesn't really affect you because if you can sell those two items really quickly, it doesn't matter who you sell them to, if, he, if that other trader bought them out or if you know, somebody else bought them out quickly. And of course the drawback is just that um, your profit won't be quite as large as if you tried to you know, snipe them by a penny instead of snipe them by you know, 100K ISK. But yeah, if it does work, then it's a very fast sell and it's an SCP, which, oh, and if you don't know what an SCP is, it's a somebody else's problem. So now it's somebody else's problem to try to sell off that item. You already sold it. It's out of your hands. Okay, and finally, market cornering. I went over this briefly earlier, but I don't know if it got recorded, so I'll just go over it again. 
But cornering the market essentially is something that's really, really, I guess, what's the term, high-end? It's something that you need a whole lot of capital for, for the most part. And the whole idea of that is to get the, the entire market to go the way that you want it. The, um, the, the most common way to do it is to just have so much capital that you can buy out every other seller on the market. So that, um, that's, that's a good example. Let me, somebody link the reinforced roll, the RRTPs, the 1600 millimeter RRTPs. <laughs> Shuttles used to be a good thing to try to do it, but nowadays the margin is so low that it's not really worth it. You, for shuttles, you're, you're basically um, trying to corner the market for people who are too lazy to go someplace else to buy a cheaper shuttle. But shuttles are so cheap but that people can easily reseed the market very quickly, which is why they're, they're usually not all that great for um, trying to corner. Thank you. Yeah, the, the RRTPs. So somebody linked the 1600 millimeter reinforced rolled tungsten plates one. And I wanted to just use this as, as an example because remember when I mentioned that somebody tried to corner the market and I joined him to try to do it? This is what we tried to do it with, the 1600 millimeter RRTPs. And as you can imagine by looking at the buy and sell orders for that, they are selling for around a four the, see, the buy orders are, are about 4 million, the sell orders are about 4.3. So yeah, to buy, to do it, you'll have to take a look at all the sell orders and you'll need to add up all the quantities in the sell orders up to the point where you want to um, manipulate the market. So right now there's lots of sell orders at like at really distant, probably low sex stations at 3.9. There's a bunch at heck. Actually, there's a bunch of Aldrat at 4.5 or so, and all the heck ones are at like 4.744, and there's a lot of them. If you wanted to corner the market, first of all, you'd want to try to target the major trade hub in that region, which in this case is heck. Heck is selling for all the way up to 4.9 million for each of them, and it looks like the volume could easily go into like the 300 or 400 of them if you wanted to buy like everything all the way up to the 4.9 million mark. So yeah, as you could imagine, um, it takes a whole lot of capital to be able to, um, to corner a market. And you can corner markets that, that are with items a lot less cheaper than this, obviously. So don't use this as like your, your measuring stick. This is one of the more expensive items you could try to corner a market with. But um, yeah, so you do need a lot of um, initial investment. And basically, if I were to try to corner the market, I would have to buy everything in the sell orders list all the way up to the 4.9 million mark. And so we would just buy, buy all of those, just flat out buy them all so that we would have, you know, 300 or 400, 1600 millimeter RRTPs sitting in our hangar. And then the reason it works is because even though we're going to be reselling them at about 4.99 million again, which is just below the 5 million best price mark, actually we could probably even sell them for like 5.3 million again. Now the reason it works is that even though you'll, you'll probably have to resell them at your highest price all over again, you now, first of all, you are the, by far the, the largest seller in the market. And also, remember that you bought a whole lot of them at 3.9, 4.0, 4.3, 4.4, 4.7, .4, and you're trying to resell them at 4.9. So even though you're, you don't have this really huge margin, it's still at a profit. So if you can sell them all at 4.9, even if you bought them at 4.7, you're still going to make a profit, and again, you're still the, the major seller in the region, so the profit is going to go to you until other sellers start putting in their stock. Okay, so that's what market cornering is. And uh, the risks for anybody who um, would even think about it for half a second would probably be pretty obvious. If somebody else has an amount of stock, when you do that, they can easily, easily snipe you and just start dropping the price again. 
So as soon as you started selling it for 4.9, all of a sudden they dump their stuff at like 4.8. And then all of a sudden, since you've got to sell a lot of all of your stuff at you know 4.8 or lower, that cuts into your profits. And eventually they could they could start selling it at so low that you'll have to sell at a loss. But it is something to to well. I don't know if it would be something to consider until you become this major market mogul, but it is something also earlier on to watch out for if somebody else tries to do it, like somebody mentioned earlier in chat. Oh, gosh, I totally forgot who it was. It might have been Jerain. But, yeah, it's something to watch out for because if somebody tries to do that and you have some stock yourself, even if it's a little tiny bit of stock, maybe it's only five 1,600-millimeter um, plates, as soon as they drop in, you know, their... 100 or 200 or 300 plates at some really ridiculously huge price, all of a sudden, you've got a chance to sell your five plates for the same ridiculously huge price. So feel free to jump in there while the price is still super high. Yeah, it was terrain. So yeah, feel free to jump in there while the price is super high. Dump your, your stock as quickly as you can before the price levels off again to something lower. And yeah, if you can actually pull it off, you, you've got a good chance of some seriously high profits. But, um, yeah, it is very hard to pull off completely. Um, a lot of times, I think I would say most of the time, you'll pull it off, but only with a, with a very narrow profit margin, not as much as you would have been able to if you fully pulled it off. But there's also the risk of um, you totally messing it up and you know, losing a whole, a whole bunch of risk. Let's see, Brennick asks, is that what the guacamole spikes are? What do you mean by guacamole spikes? Did you mean the Donchian channel, since that, that color is kind of... Oh, the green spikes. It's hard to tell what exactly the green spikes are. If you go back to the, um, to the graph and take a look at the median day price dots, and then there's the green spikes that go through the dots. Is that what you mean, the vertical spikes? Yeah, the, that defines the highest and lowest that the, um, the items have been selling for. And it's kind of hard to tell if that really is a market manipulation. That's probably not the best indicator. The best indicator of a market manipulation is like a, a more or less steady graph suddenly jumping by a million or two. That would be an obvious indicator of market manipulation. Really deep and shallow spikes like that for the, the min and max that is usually an indication of somebody either making a weird mistake and, you know, accidentally um, selling for a different price than they thought they were or buying for a different price than they thought they were. Or somebody trying to, um, well, yeah, it could be like a minor attempt at a market manipulation also. Oh, the volume indicators at the bottom, the bars. Okay, yeah, for the volume indicators, if, if you see a, a big spike, if it's just a single spike, uh, it would only be an indication of manipulation if the graph above the bars also did something really weird, such as jump suddenly up. If it's just like a big spike, but the, the price itself pretty much remains constant, then that would much more likely be a somebody dumping a lot of their items into the market all at once or buying a lot of things from the market all at once, which is not necessarily, you know, something devious happening in the market. And in fact, every so often, it might actually be something totally benign. Like, for example, every so often I've got to, when I restock the hangers, for those of you who don't know, I'm also the, um, the hanger section manager, but every so often we have to actually buy stuff from the market to restock the hangers because our production section is too busy with other stuff and we need stuff. So sometimes I'll go to the market and buy stuff and it, it really can wipe out the market when you have to buy the kind of volumes that Eve University needs. <laughs> yeah, especially really um, popular stuff like um, EWAR modules and... You know, shield extenders and things like that for when we start a war. Sometimes we just don't have enough to support the war yet, so we go to an actual nearby market and just mass buy it so that we could put in the hangers for everybody to use. And then when e when EUni you know buys 
200 medium shield extenders, the market notices. And yeah, you'll see a spike. I don't know if that's an accurate example, but yeah, you know, numbers like that. Let's see, looking for more questions that I might have missed. Oh, Jerain says, in case you didn't get what I was saying by market collusion. Yeah, I didn't go into detail about market collusion, but um, for those who want to know what, what that is, it's basically, um, you know how I said that sometimes people will try to try to get information about who else is in the market and who, who their, um, like their, their major competitors are, or at least, you know, some other major players in the market. Every so often, somebody might approach, you know, a major player might approach another major player once they identify um, who the other person is. And then they might say, hey, you want to, you know, try to do some market manipulation, which kind of goes back to the, you know, things like cornering, et cetera, that I just mentioned. Um, if you get, a, a, you know, two or three or more major players in the market all colluding with each other to try to affect trends in the market, then you might see some really weird stuff happening. It doesn't seem to happen very often, but, yeah, sometimes you'll see evidence of what may or may not be some kind of major collusion. A lot of times, though, um, marketers seem to be a little bit more selfish and they try to do something just by themselves. <laughs> Grace Steele asks, have you identified a number of major market players? Nope. Like I said, I, I only really do market trading as a side thing. Um, but it's never been like a, a major income source for me, which is probably why I don't have more money than I actually do, even though I've been playing for two years. <laughs> but yeah, it's... um. I like market trading, but it's not like my favorite thing to do in the game. So I don't really do it as much as I can. So I haven't even tried to do stuff like try to identify who the other players are. One thing I do, though, is um, since I, I mission a lot, that's probably my the biggest source of income for me by far, I don't sell my mission loot in, in, um, in like with any regularity. I save it up for like somewhere between six months and a year. So if you can imagine all that missioning loot just gathering and gathering for like an entire year almost with this last one. And then I just shove it all into a freighter, haul it all over to Jita, and then just try to sell it all at once. And I, I could easily imagine people in Jita thinking that I am a major player just because I happen to have a year's worth of loot, you know, trying to sell in one giant chunk all at once. So chances are... That some people might have me on their list just because I do that. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't try to look for other people myself because I, I don't really do that much trading myself. <laughs> Brennick says, now that I think about it, a corp could war deck a, ma a major corp for the explicit reason of market warfare. That is, hmm, that's entirely possible. They would have to make up the two million ISK war deck fee or if they war deck a corporation, I mean an alliance. They'd have to make up a 50 million war deck fee. But, um, yeah, I, I can imagine. It's not really a whole lot of risk for, like, for example, if you war deck EU and it costs you 50 million, but if you set a whole bunch of sell orders in Aldrat, <laughs> I wonder if you'd be able to make that 50 million back. It doesn't seem like it would be very lucrative, though, because major corps usually have a pretty good stockpile already. So it would... It would take some a pretty lengthy and costly war to have them deplete their stockpiles and have to turn to the market. So yeah, like in EUNI, we, we wouldn't have to go to the market. I think I've only ever purchased stuff for the market. I mean, for the, for a war from the market once for like one war, and it was only about a dozen total items. So if they could have predicted what those dozen total items would be, they could have probably made up, made off with a pretty decent fortune. But unless they knew exactly what those items were that we were short on, then I, I doubt they would have made anything. Phylax asks, what's considered a high volume item? If the items I trade seem to be going quite slow, although they, they are quite commonly used. Um, there's very few items that will sell in such high volume that if you sat here for like half an hour, you, you would see one move. The, the obvious um, exceptions to that are like ammo. 
everybody's always buying ammo. But even then, there's certain types of ammo that will sell very quickly, and consequently, they have a lot of um, competition in their market. But there's other types of ammo that will sell as slow as modules. It seems like you, if you try to sell that ammo, it'll sit in your sell order for ages before somebody ever buys it. So there's definitely some ammo that's more popular than others. And it's probably easy to, to figure out um, what some of the more popular ammo is. Like, for example, antimatter. Everybody uses antimatter for PvP, so that's probably a good high volume one. Um, same with EMP. You know, for PvP, everybody likes to use the, the really high damage ammo. So antimatter, EMP. What is the laser crystal that is multi-frequency crystals? Yeah, plasma is also high damage since they made the changes to the um, projectile ammo. EMP, pla face plasma, and there's a third one. All have high damage and low range. Yeah, and some Tech 2 ammo will... Um, will probably sell pretty well. I haven't actually looked into Barrage yet, but from what I know about it, it's really popular and might sell really well. It looks like the, yeah, looking at it right now, it looks like the price difference, you can make a good 45 or so ISK out of reselling that. Hmm, maybe even more because the 150 buy order is only 4,000 rounds. But yeah, so stuff like that. If you're going to concentrate on volumes, on volume orders, then stuff like that would be really good to look at. Um, for modules, though, you, you you typically won't see things selling quite that quickly. So you know you might have to wait a few hours to even a couple of days, depending on the module, before you see some movement. Unless, of course, you try to sell a Jita, in which case you know things just happen ten times faster there. Yeah, you'll hear Jita mentioned a lot for um, station trading. And if you could get an alt parked in Jita, especially an, an alt with some pretty good um, trading skills. Oh, and by the way, about using an alt for trading, um, if you can't afford the remote trading books, having an alt parked in the Jita station itself will obviously get you around that. You don't have to learn any remote trading if your alt is never going to move away from the station that he's going to trade at. So that's what a lot of people do is just make an alt, park them in Jita, and the only things they train on that alt are the ones that decrease the, um, well, that increase the number of market orders and decrease the fees, the, um, the broker's fee and the taxes with the market orders. And they don't bother with remote trading at all. And they just park them there, and every so often they'll log on to the alt, check on market orders for, you know, 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever, and then log off again and, you know, go back to their main and do stuff they do other stuff. And, yeah, I kind of digress there. What the heck was I talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah, so volume stuff. Um, yeah, so for, yeah, I think I already said that, for um, things like modules and such, they'll move a lot slower, but they'll still move. So, any more questions? Let me see if I've gone over everything in the notes also. <laughs> Canceling buy orders. Canceling any orders. Um, basically, first of all, when you modify an order, when you open up your wallet, look at your orders, and you want to modify an order, you may have, some of you may have noticed that modify order is right next to cancel order. Be very, very careful about which one you select. I don't know how much money I've lost because I've accidentally canceled an order instead of modified it. But yes, any order that you have active, you can cancel it. Um, you will not get your broker's fee back. And since tax is not, um, tax isn't an issue if you cancel an order because tax isn't applied until the transaction takes place. But you will lose the broker's fee if you cancel an order. So if it's something that was like really expensive and you paid a whole lot for a broker's fee, then that's something you want to be really careful that you don't accidentally cancel. If it's a buy order and you cancel it, you'll still get the, um, the escrow back. So you'll get the money back that you've set aside to try to buy those items. But you just will lose the broker's fee. Okay. If I missed anybody's questions, go ahead and um, retype them just so that I can make sure to get to you. 100% of, oh, Phylax, are you saying, 
file accessing um, for me usually disappears 100% of the fee, including escrow. So you're actually losing your escrow for a buy order. That is definitely not the way it's supposed to work. Yet yeah, um, you're not supposed to just suddenly lose all your money <laughs> with a buy order. So, hmm. Okay, Mad Machina is saying it just takes a while to get back. That that might be true. I, I've never tried to look for um, the cash again, like immediately after canceling a buy order. So it, yeah, maybe it just takes a little while for it to reappear in your wallet. I hope anyway. Yeah, Mad Machine is saying, some, I've noticed it takes five minutes to over an hour sometimes. Wow, I, I'd be surprised if it took over an hour, but yeah, maybe. Okay, let's see, going through my notes. Um, hints, tips, and best procedures. Um, well, first of all, it's difficult to single-handedly kill the market. <laughs> um, a lot of people... A lot of people will sometimes say, you know, don't do this and don't do that because you're going to really mess up the market if you do that. Um, like, for example, there, if something has a high buy of one million and a low sell of two million, and you, some people will say, um, don't try to mess that up. You know, if you set another buy, set it for a million and one penny, because if you try to set a buy for, say, 1.25 million, you know, just to make sure that you're the one who actually buys it. You're going to mess up the market. It's totally messing up the market for everybody. No, you're not really messing up the market for everybody. Um, you're lowering your own profits for that, for that particular item, because you could probably have sold or probably have bought them for a million and one penny. But you, that is sometimes a, a like a, a decision that traders make to go ahead and you know, try to set it for some much higher price just so that they can be sure that they're the ones who, who get the item fulfilled either most quickly or, you know, right away. Or, you know, just as fast as possible, actually, is what I'm trying to say. So that won't mess up the market. Um, what might happen, though, is that people will, will think that that's the new low buy price and then set up a whole bunch of other orders for it. But then, really, if the market can support a large volume at that new low buy price, then it's just the market really correcting itself anyway. And if the market cannot support it, then it will just kind of, you know, sit there for a while. But I guess a buy, a buy order is not a very good example because um, if it's, for example, something like Mission Loot, then people will sell it to the buy order no matter how much it is. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of people also say um, they'll, mess, they'll mess up the, the market if you, you know, instead of going, instead of changing the best order by a penny, you try to um, snipe it by like 100,000 or something like that. But don't worry, the market will always correct itself. It, you can actually single-handedly mess up the market that way, but that goes into the realm of market cornering. You will have to have such a huge volume in comparison to everybody else or such a huge price difference in comparison to everybody else to actually make a, a really lasting impact on the market. It will resettle. So you can try to you know, single-handedly modify the market that way if you want, but there's, again, it's almost always temporary. It usually takes a lot of risk. And in general, you're just, you're just miss, you're you're messing up your own profit just to try to do something more quickly. So you want to um, really just ask yourself, is it worth the, less, the um, lower profit just to make it move quick, more quickly? Sometimes the answer is yes, and at that point, that's when you might want to consider doing that. Okay, and so along those lines, always remember that um, sniping by just a penny, well, that's the best way to maximize your profits. That's why people do it all the time. <laughs> But um, if you want, like I said earlier, if you want to um, snipe by something really large just to sell or buy more quickly, you could do that. But also, sniping by more than just a penny but not very large, like sniping by two cents or five cents or something like that, you could do that as well. It will give you a bit of leeway for accidents, like if you accidentally snipe by, you know, 50,000 instead of 5,000. Well, no, that's a bad example. But if you accidentally type um, incorrect values or something like that, it's really hard to really mess up if 
the incorrect value is only incorrect by a few pennies instead of only in accidentally an incorrect value by 100,000 or something. But beyond that, there's really not a whole lot of points in using you know, a two cent snipe range instead of a one cent snipe range. And finally, there is something that I couldn't think of a better name for, so I call them forced math farts. And that's when you cause someone to have a brain fart and do some incorrect math and, you know, try to snipe you, but then they really didn't. They're not easy to do. I mean, they're easy to do, but they're, they're not easy a trap to fall into. So um, a lot of people w won't fall into that trap. But for example, if you set a sell order for 10,001 penny, then somebody might take a look at that and have a little brain fart for a second and say, all right, I'm going to snipe them and set a sell order for 10,002 pennies. But for sell orders, you want it to be lower, remember? So they didn't snipe you. They actually just pushed themselves in behind you. So you could, some people try to do those little kinds of tricks. They, they don't really often work. But when they do work, it is kind of funny. So you might want to go ahead and try to do it yourself. Yeah, force trade parts. That, that'd be good. But they mostly have to do with math, so that's why I call them forced math parts. Yeah, there's, there's lots of little tricks like that. Like if somebody is trying to sell for 210, um, like a sell order for 210, you set yours for, say, 209. Point oh gosh, what was the trick there? I forget. <laughs> well, anyways. You could come up with all sorts of little um, tricks like that without too much effort. The um, the ten thousand and one, or the ten thousand point oh one thing was is like the the most common and most obvious one. And okay, so that's pretty much it. Does anybody have any further questions or comments or ideas or anything at all? Did I briefly go over mixing it with hall trading, mixing station trading with hall trading? I don't remember that in my notes, but I think I like briefly mention it as an answer to somebody's question. But anyways, yeah, there's there's a um, a potentially very large amount of profit if you mix hall trading with station trading. Um, there's two ways you could do that, really. Well, there's a third way that has to do with um, trying to corner the market, but um, I th I think that's what that's the type that I did go over. But there's two more common ways to mix station trading and hall trading, and one way to do it is to um, to trade, to set your buy orders at a station in a region where an item is, is most prevalent, and then haul it to some place where the item is a lot less prevalent, but may still be in demand. For example, missioners in Kaldari space, in the Kaldari space region, will have a lot more drops of, say, missile launchers and hybrid weapons than, say, missioners in an Amar Amarian region. But there is still a demand for, especially missile launchers, in Amarian regions because um, a lot of people still consider missiles the best, um, the best PVE weapon just because it's so easy to, well, that's a whole other class, really. But, yeah, missiles are, are, are considered um, some of the best PVE weapons. So they're... They are in demand everywhere, including in the Marian regions. So one thing that people do is they set their buy orders in Jita, which is in the Kaldari region, and in fact, the biggest trade hub in the game, and they buy just tons of missile launchers there. But instead of reselling them immediately at Jita, they shove them in a freighter or whatever hauler they have, and they haul them over to a Marian space, and they go to, the, to Amar which is the Amarian trade hub, and then they sell them there. So if you can um, if you could do a little bit of research, you might be able to find items like that that will, if you, um, if you would have sold them, well, bought them and sold them in the same station, they'll, get, they'll make you some decent profit, but they'll make you even more profit if you, if you um, haul them over to a different trade hub and then sell them there instead. And Sasha says, um, Galente L4 and lasers from Amar and Sancha missions drop well and halt. To sell in Amar, you get double than what you get in Galente space. Yeah, that's tr that too. So yeah, to do the kind of market research you need to be able to identify those types of items, you basically just have to um, 
go between those those types of regions and just take a look at what the prices are. If um, you'll almost always be able to find an item that you could you know just buy and sell for a good profit just in a single station. But then go go ahead and go to a different trade hub and see what the price is there. And if it's significantly higher, it might be well worth hauling your stuff to the other trade hub and selling it there also. And then another way you could use um, haul trading to supplement your station trading is not even taking it to a trade hub, but taking it to a mission hub. Mission hubs are, there are a lot more mission hubs than trade hubs. Well, I wouldn't say a lot more, but there are noticeably more <laughs> mission hubs than trade hubs. And there's a lot of mission runners who, if, um, if they don't have to, to jump all the way over to a trade hub, if there's stuff available right where they're missioning from, they'll just go ahead and buy it right there, especially things like ammunition. Um, there's a lot of times, if, if you've run a lot of missions, you've probably encountered this a lot, that you know, you've, you're running low on ammunition and you're thinking, oh man, I've got to you know, jump five or ten or however many jumps over to the nearest trade hub to buy more ammunition because there's just none being sold here. So a lot of people will, will use um, station buy orders to buy lots of things like ammunition or, or even you know, some modules, like if somebody needs to refit their ship or something, they'll also do it with modules. Then they'll, as soon as they fulfill the buy order, they'll haul it over to a, to a mission hub and sell the items there directly to the mission runners. Yeah, ammo, drones, um, since those, anything that gets consumed a lot, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say consumed with drones, but yeah, people lose drones every so often. But ammunition definitely gets consumed a lot, so ammunition is really good to resell at a trade hub, or sorry, at a mission hub. And alternately, you could do it in the opposite direction too. Um, because people will sometimes um, salvage and loot their missions at the mission hub a lot, they'll just collect all their stuff over there at their, um, their missioning station. And sometimes if they can see some pretty decent buy orders at, that, at the missioning station, that'll save them the whole hassle of having to haul it over to a trade hub to sell it. So they'll sell it directly to you at their missioning station. Now, a lot of people say that this is because, you know, missioners are lazy and stuff like that. It's, it's not really that they are lazy. It's because they, they know how to more efficiently make ISK, and they can make ISK more efficiently by running another mission than by having to jump, you know, five or ten jumps out to, to um, restock their ammo or, you know, having to haul, spend a whole afternoon hauling all their mission loot over to a trade hub to sell it there. Um, it's, it's a conscious decision to just maximize their own profits by doing the things that, um, well, doing the things that get them the most income. And, you know, hauling stuff around is just not very good income over time. The thing is, the reason why it's very good income over time for you is that you're not only hauling a single person's mission loot. If you set, um, you know, a good volume of buy orders, you're probably selling mission loot from you know, a dozen or a hundred even different missioners at a time, hauling it all at once over to your, um, over to the trade hub and then selling it all at once. <laughs> yeah, and as Ellen says, you can get ganked. So um, try not to haul too much stuff at a time so that the whole, the whole rule of caution on getting ganked is make sure you don't haul stuff that is worth more than what it would take to gank you. So if you, or if the people thinking about ganking you would have to spend, say, 50 million in ships to be able to kill you because Concord would have killed 50 million um, worth of their ships after, after insurance, of course, um, then don't carry more than 50 million worth of, of um, loot in your hold. Yep, yep. Yeah, there's been a couple of examples recently of very lucrative suicide ganking. One of them was actually here in EUNI, but um, the, the really infamous one was in the, um, the front page news, front page Eve news, that is, where somebody was hauling like, I think Ellen just posted about it, yeah, about 13 billion worth of blueprints in an industrial. You don't need 13 billion worth of ships to gank an industrial, so yeah, that was a total win for the people who actually made off with it. 
But yeah, just about like a week and a half ago, also in EU, somebody was flying their Raven. And, sorry, their, I think it was a Navy Raven. They're flying that out. And it had about a total worth of about 2.7 billion disk. And they got, he got ganked. Um, as you could imagine, he got ganked by a pretty sizable force. It takes quite a lot to be able to kill a CNR um, before Concord appears to wipe you out. So he got ganked, I think, by like nine battleships or something like that. So yeah, the, uh, the gankers lost nine battleships, but they were able to get his really expensive, um, well, actually, no, they didn't, if I remember right. They tried to get his really expensive faction modules to drop, and a few of them did, but the really, really expensive ones didn't. <laughs> Jerry asks, how would, how would you not have an escort if you're flying 13 billion worth of ISK? Um, even if you had an escort, they really couldn't do much because it's really the, mostly the alpha that wipes out um, a ship in a suicide gank, especially a, an industrial. He, he just plain shouldn't have been flying an industrial in the first place. So there's, there's no reason to haul 13 billion worth of blueprints in an industrial. Heck, even a frigate would have been a much better choice because at least he's fast, he could align quickly. Um, pro nobody probably would have had any time to scan him to see that he had 13 billion worth of blueprints in him. And yeah, Saja says that that is the absolute best way to move stuff to avoid um, suicide ganks is an, an Orca's corp hanger because it can't be scanned, and even if you do get suicide gank, it won't drop. So it doesn't matter if they can't scan it anyway. They'll never be able to get to it. So just put all the valuable stuff in the corp hanger in Norga. <laughs> or yeah, or a, a cloaking ship. Um, pretty much anything. If it's just blueprints, you could fit that. You don't even need a blockade runner for that. You could fit that in a <laughs> in a co-op. And yes. Don't autopilot when you're carrying 13 billion tests worth of stuff. Oh, okay. I just got an um, email message from Brannock. I'm going to go ahead and answer it here just because it is sort of kind of related, even though it's sort of kind of not. He was just asking if I, anything, if I know anything about trading corporate stocks. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, it's pretty broken and useless. It, it was intended as a way of having, you know, well, just like it says, have, being able to trade stocks in a corporation so that, first of all, you could share in the corporation's profits, but also certain stockholders would be able to get, you know, like a um, votes to do stuff for the corporation. But it's really kind of broken because, uh, gosh, I forget exactly what the reasons are, but there's just problems with um, ha with people being able to control stuff about a corporation just because they own the stock of it. And so just about no corporations out there ever really send out their stock to you know other people to, to own. They just keep it with one person just because it's a lot easier and a lot safer. I would have to look up exactly what can be done if you, know, you, you actually get somebody with too much stock or something like that. But yeah, it's, in general, it's just a security risk, first of all. And... It, it doesn't really add anything to the game. It doesn't even make things much simpler except for, um, except for giving out, you know, ISK for something. But then you could just do that manually and without the security risk. Yeah, Saja says, if you have control of stock, you vote, you vote yourself CEO and strip others of the roles. Um, that might be true. I didn't think it was quite that bad, but now that I think about it, if it's not that bad, it's, it's really close. <laughs> so, yeah, essentially people, it's a security risk because if somehow somebody gets a hold of too much of the stock, you know, if you put too much out of, if you put too much of the stock out into the public and then somebody somehow gets a hold of a majority of it, then they'll have way too much power, more power um, over the corp than most people really care to give them. And yeah, if it's so much power that they can vote themselves to be the CEO, then I definitely can see why nobody would really want to um, make their stock public. Then Jerrine asks, would he be able to buy it out, close the corp, and liquidate for himself? Yeah, like I said, I forget exactly what kind of power it gives you if you get the majority shares. So yeah, whatever it is, though, it's pretty sizable. 
Yeah, and because people don't want, you know, just some random um, person out in EVE somewhere to get a majority share of their stock, the most they would ever even consider releasing would be, you know, half the shares. But if you could only release half the shares out to other people, then there's really not much point in doing it. You could just, you know, manually um, share profits or whatever without risking shares getting out. So, any other questions, especially marketing-related ones? I should hold another Q&A soon. The last Q&A I did, it was like a wartime Q&A, so we had to go over the, um, the questions and answers like really, really fast, just to make sure that everybody's wartime-related questions got addressed. But yeah, so for those of you who know what the Q&As are, um, I'll probably be holding another one, I don't know, sometime in the next few days. Oh, wow, no more questions. Okay, well, seeing as how I officially ended the class like an hour and a half ago anyway, I will officially end the end of the class again, I guess. So again, thanks everybody for coming and listening.